Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley. I'm Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest, the amazing James, hegemon of all that is science and wearer of fancy lab coats. I've forgotten about my title. <laughs> <laughs> As always, we're wearing togas, we're eating olives and today we're looking at Alexander's Companions. Round one. Previously on Stupid Ancient History, we've been looking at Alexander the Great's youth and his rise to power in Macedonia. For now. Yeah. Uh, we've looked at Alexander's youth and how, despite being born as heir to the Macedonian throne, he didn't really have a straightforward childhood. Because his parents were at each other's throats all the time, effectively using him as a ping pong ball. Nice. Um, but despite all these tensions and conflicts within the royal household, Alexander's intelligence, his temper, and his cunning began to take shape. And he did have the usual teenage boy drama, like taming an untamable horse, fighting the war against Thebes, getting into a punch-up with your dad at his seventh wedding. Pretty standard yeah. stuff, yeah. Uh, until by the age of 18, Alexander was catapulted to the throne following the death of Philip. Whose untimely assassination meant that Alexander inherited not only Macedonia, but an army ready to invade Persia. Two for the price of one. Which was nice. <laughs> not so much for Philip. No. My dad will just leave me a knackered golf. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you can invade Persia in it, you're fine. Uh, so, in your introduction, uh, I had a question. Go on. Not more than one, but one one came for, like in my mind immediately. Go on then. Uh, I'm sure this is probably a common thing in in you know, ancient history and all your sources. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by companion? That's a good question, James. Because you, 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 <laughs> you, you told me Philip had companions, and he did have companions. One ended up stabbing him to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that's true. as the name suggests, the companions were people who were quite close to Alexander and primarily members of the royal court. Okay. But obviously, given the militaristic nature of Macedonia and Philip and now Alexander, these companions, they're not just kind of ephemerate hangers-on and begs yeah. um, and lackeys. They're often generals and officers within the army as well. D were, these, were they made officers and generals by being his companions? Or do officers and generals, be, does he choose his companions from his officers and generals? Uh, I, I would probably suggest a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. I mean, okay. a lot of them are Macedonian aristocrats. They're from the wealthier families. But Philip being Philip, you know, he's not going to be hanging around with someone who cries if they stub their finger. He's going to be hanging out with the lads who like a scrap yeah. and can so see him right on the battlefield. Okay, fair enough. I, I now think I know what you mean when you say companion. <laughs> and your second question? Um... Why round one? You chipped in with that. Because ha most of them don't get to the end of the story. James. Oh, I thought, I, okay, I thought you meant he had so many. We had to do <laughs> volumes of them. <laughs> he does, but not at the same time. Does he get like a second posse at some point? There is a second posse coming right. later on. Okay. All right, so members of the royal court. Mm -hmm. um, who are they? What do we know? Well, interestingly enough, like the brand new fancy Macedonian army that Alexander actually inherits, um, he inherits a lot of these companions from his dad, from okay. Philip. Yeah, so a lot of the key players are somewhat older than Alexander, but they serve with his dad for a number of years. So the, these are the ones who went out with him on his mad lad campaign. Yeah, et which kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you've got a new king... You're like, well, we'll surround him with very experienced men gonna, to help him along I was going to ask, I, I presume this like helped with like, the transition of power and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, but he's still hanging out with his dad's mates. Yeah, does he, does he have many of his own mates? Does he well, not? Does he not? <laughs> he's too busy for that, isn't he's he? He's too busy for he's too mates. busy for mates. So, yeah, it's a very much, it's exactly what I said. Um, a lot of these are likely to be part of like the... The entourage that Alexander mocked when he was trying to tame Bucephalus. Yeah. And most of them will have been at Philip's wedding to see the fallout. The throwing cups. The throwing cups, yeah. Throwing yeah. Cups. yeah. Um, but what's probably most important about this, particularly this first round of companions, is exactly what you said. They're seen as a safe pair of hands. They know what they're doing. To protect this new king. And obviously, if he's interested in going to war, 
these are the guys who know which end of the spear to hold. How how quickly did his like? I, I know it's expected of a king, but how quickly did Axan go? That bit over there, I'm having that. Suspiciously quickly. Right. Okay. But that's a story for next week. Right. Okay. So who are we talking about first in the in the posse? In the posse, in the squad. Yeah. Um, well, it comes to the idea of a safe pair of hands. There's only one place we can start, mm. and that's Parmenio. I've heard of him before. Yeah. So Parmenio was without a doubt Philip's top general, and to a large extent, his kind of right hand man. Yeah, so it's Parmenia who defeats the Illyrians when Alexander's born, which is meant to be one of yeah. these omens. And it's also Parmenia who was chosen to lead the advance party to Persia and keep Attalus away from Philip's big party. Right. So Also uh, disappears Attalus yeah, yeah, yeah. quite quickly. He, he, he got shuffled off suspiciously, yeah. didn't he? So he knows what he's doing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Parmenia is is the man. He's been heavily involved in the development of the Macedonian army that's allowed Macedonia to become the big power in Greece. Longer, bigger, pointier spears. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's often found commanding the infantry on the important left wing of the army. Why is the left wing important? It's kind of... With the Macedonians, it's the most exposed. So on the very right wing... Is that... Do they hold, like, their shields in the right hand? No, it's not to do with shields, because they can't hold shields, they've got big pointy sticks. Fair enough. Um, the cavalry and Alexander and all the kind of, the elites would be on the right okay. um, with the cavalry and they would attack from the right, so the left hand was where they were seen as weakest. Okay. Because um, he's furthest away from the powers that be at any one point, so you need a guy on that end who he knows the plan, run things himself, knows right? what he's doing, isn't going to be constantly going... Oh, what would Alexander do? What would Alexander okay. do? Yeah, you need a guy on the end who so knows they, what they he's have doing. this. Is, do they always do this? A very prescriptive kind of battle plan, like cavalry on the right. Yeah, like by this time it becomes very, very typical. Even and when you swap it the other way around, the Persians would normally attack from the right, attacking the left flank where right, Parmenio okay. is. So you need someone who's one can do things on his own, knows what he's doing, and isn't going to cry as soon as he sees some big horses coming towards him. Fair enough. That's him. Uh, so he's not a soft lad. He's, you no. Won't, you won't pick a fight with him. Not if you want him to come out of it well. No, he's definitely the kind of bloke you'd want on your side in a fight. Okay. Yeah. So whether it's scrapping on a battlefield or in a pub car park, <laughs> he, he's the man with the most experience in Alexander's army. He's been there, done it, stabbed it, conquered it. Okay. And again, even he was Philip's second in command, and a lot of the time, Parmenio comes across as Alexander's second in command as well. Okay, so that, you know, he's doing all right for himself. He's doing very well for himself. So very often, it's Parmenio who's trying to kind of advise Alexander against some of his more elaborate schemes as a more cautious and traditional tactician. How elaborate does Alexander oh, want you to wait. get? He's got some mad lad ideas. He's not going to declare war on the sea or anything like that, is he? <laughs> no, he wins that war. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no, but he's quite interesting. With the Macedonian court, they have this idea of first amongst equals. So okay. when it comes to strategy meetings, it's not like the Persians who's got the king on top and says, like, I am the king, you do what I say, mm. and everyone goes, bad idea, but all right. Um, the Macedonians are more about kind of sharing ideas. So Alexander will have a plan, and because of the way they can interact with each other, and it is usually Parmenia, because mm. he's got the experience, it's quite acceptable in the Macedonian army for them to shout him down and go, no, bad idea, okay. think again, kid. So it's not like a speak up, get <coughs> killed sort of scenario. No, it's not, it's not meant to be. And again, with Parmenia, it's kind of like, Calm down, lad. When you've had a few more years under your belt, okay, then okay. you so, But it's that kind of friendly mentorship criticism okay. rather than saying you're an absolute weapon, what are you playing at? Did he have. What was his relationship with Parmenio like before he became king? Or was it just kind of turn up day one? Hi, I'm your supervisor. We, we, we don't massively know. He will have known about him. Mm. If he's always hanging around with Philip, he'll have yeah. met him a few times. He's probably got significant respect for him because again it's Parmenio who seems to be doing a lot of the legwork for Philip okay so Alexander clearly when he comes to creating his army he'll be like I want I want that one right, that's okay. the one I want yeah so without Parmenio commanding the infantry 
things could have gone very differently. Okay, yeah, he's pretty important. Uh, so he's got his veteran commander kind of buddy helping yep. him out. Uh, who's next? Who else? Clytus the Black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask the obvious question. Uh, why is he called the Black? Uh, because of his hair, James. Okay. <laughs> They're Greek. They don't all black hair. <laughs> well. Mm. So it's most likely that many of the Macedonian courtiers would have had a fairer complexion, like Alexander. Whereas he was Clytus, ginger, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. Strawberry blonde. So Clytus stood out because he resembled someone from a much further kind of southern part of Greece. Okay, I didn't. I didn't know. I thought Alex was like Alexander was like the outlier, being like ginger and bit blondy. No, Macedonians were probably a lot fairer. Oh, I mean, okay, the fact okay. that they point out, look at him. He's weird. He's got <laughs> black hair. In Greece, I never thought what? I'd see the day. Um, okay, so. Uh, was he actually Macedonian or did he come from another part of Greece? Or um, unsure. Uh, unsure. He just doesn't fit the bill of a He, he just Macedonian. looks different to everyone else, so he becomes Clytus the Black. Okay, I'm assuming he wasn't just in court just there because, for the because hair. he had black <laughs> Look hair. Look at his hair! Uh, no. Like a diversity hire. <laughs> <laughs> he was the Rachel of Macedonia. <laughs> um, no, definitely. I mean, like Parmenio, Clytus is a good 20 years older than Alexander. And his sister was Alexander's nurse. Right, okay. So yeah, there's a there's an age gap. But yeah, he's, pretty yeah. big one by the sound of it. Yeah. Um, but again, he was one of Philip's most trusted men. However, unlike Parmenio, he was a cavalry officer and commanded the, the royal squadron in battle, which was a position of high honour. Was Parmenio's position not one of high honour? Um, it, the infantry were regarded more kind of the the lower classes. Okay. So if you're in the cavalry, you tended to be wealthier, more aristocratic. So is is this because I know like the Persians very much were like that? Is this just typical of most like old armies? If you're wishing yeah. to have a horse, yeah, you're generally a higher standing. Yeah, yeah. If you can pay for your own horse, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're not doing too bad. It's the same with the Napoleonic armies. Yeah, like Wellington's cavalry were almost entirely landowners right because they could afford horses whereas yeah. the infantry just had, weren't. had boots <laughs> yeah um yeah and obviously it's the royal squadron within the cavalry so yeah. it's a fancy bit within the fancy bit okay so he's got a pretty big support from his dad's mates yeah yeah um is this guy another steady pair of hands safe pair of hands to some extent okay um but clients has a bit of a reputation um, he's a bit different to Parmenio. Whereas Parmenio is seen as kind of cautious and well thought out, Clytus really isn't. Um, is he, he just running on his horse? Yeah, he's, he's more of a mad lad. He, I mean, there's a couple of occasions where he's known for just flowing it, flinging himself headlong into the enemy, kind of blood curdling scream. And you know, how's that worked out well for him? Because <laughs> he's. Pretty hard. <laughs> and he's not just kind of like that with the enemy. He's well known for speaking his mind when he's had a few beverages. Uh, and he likes a lot of beverages. Right, okay. Never goes massively well, does it? It's gone well for him. I mean, I kind of threw a cup at his dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's a, he's, a bit of a, he's a bit of a thug, in a way. Yeah, he's a bit of a mad brawler. Yeah. Um, he's got this fiery nature. He's not afraid to throw down. Um... But it's this nature and his skill that gets him a lot of accolades over the years. Um, and his service and experience is very highly regarded to so the point where people would look at him and go, yeah, I'm going to step over here. But then if at these kind of councils, if Parmenio is the measured kind of, no, don't do that, is he just like running and hit them? Yeah, he's, yeah. yeah, he'd be there going, go on, let's hit him, let's hit him. <laughs> do you know what? I'm bored. I'm going to go and fight him on my own. And you really don't want to argue with him when he's had a drink. <laughs> no. <laughs> So we talked about two of Philip's old mates. Yep. Yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Well, the next companion mm -hmm. is also a trusted companion of Philip. So he's he's kind of. These are all old men. Yeah. Is there anyone young in Macedonia, or is it just Alexander was born and everyone stopped having babies? <laughs> we can't be one as good as that. Let's <laughs> right, just I see. I see where you're going with this. But, they, um, they are all just. Old blokes, by the sounds of it. Yeah, I mean, this guy, um, 
is called in Antipater. Antipater. Or, or Antipater. Uh, is he another of Philip's What about Antita? He's not <laughs> an Antita. <laughs> Kind of so, thing, yeah. Um, yeah. Antipater. Antipater. Is he another one of Philip's mates? Yeah. Of course he is. So, well, of course um, he is. Yeah, he's not necessarily an old soldier, although okay. he does have military skill. He's quite different in that it's military stuff is not his main role. Basically, under Philip, whenever Philip was away on campaign, it would be Antipater who would be left to run Macedon. In he's, the more, king's he's more like a diplomat then, isn't he? Yeah, like an administrator. Yeah, administrator yeah he's sort of basically thing, a regent, a standard. Right, okay. Yeah, and with Alexander intending to be away in Persia for a while, Antipater is appointed a regent to rule Macedonia and take care of things whilst he's away. Right, right. Look at. It makes sense though, doesn't it? it? It's like, he did it for Philip and didn't try and overthrow him. Why would you randomly choose someone new when you don't know what they're going to do? I mm. think that's quite sensible to just keep using the same yeah. one. Yeah, you, 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 you watch my dad's house while he's away, now watch mine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fair yeah. enough. But it is pretty much kind of, yeah, look yeah. after my stuff while I'm off having fun with the lads kind of deal. Uh, I mean, this doesn't sound like a terrible thing because they're trying to stab you. No, there would be people trying to stab him. Oh, okay. Because no, don't right. forget, while Alexander's away, you could have lots of other people, those pesky Greeks, thinking, ha ha, now we'll see who's in charge. Bloody Greeks. Oh, no. <laughs> so, yeah, like I said, Antipater is really the ideal choice for region yeah. in Alexander's absence, because yeah. he's got all the skills that are needed. He's done it before. Yeah. Yeah, so he's a skilled diplomat who was kind of key in bringing the other Greek states into line. And he's pretty good on a battlefield when they don't do what they're told. Okay, so when he's... Alexander's big, like... Campaign. Campaign into Persia. Is he just taking the Macedonians or is he taking all of the Greeks? It's meant to be a combined Greek force. Right, okay. Um, trained in a Macedonian style. Okay. So, but yeah, so Antipater's really useful at keeping stuff in, going back there. It's also really useful as well that he's got quite a good relationship with Alexander's mum, Olympias. Forgot about her. And yeah. she is not the easiest person to get on no. with. And he's good at kind of keeping her in check. Okay. Yeah, and so he's really good at kind of calming her down and stopping her doing anything too rash. What is she likely to do? <laughs> Many things. Because she's got what she wants. Her son is now king. Yeah, but she's also a bit of a helicopter parent. Right. So okay. apparently she keeps writing to Alexander while he's on campaign. You know, the kind of like, you never ring me anymore. You never tell me anything. You don't ring me to let me know you're all right. I've been worried sick. You've been off in Persia for years. So he just doesn't let her write letters. <laughs> he, he, he calms her down quite a lot. And like I said, as soon as Philip dies, he is one of these key advisors who kind of guides Alexander in his first years of being king. Because okay. he, he, he knows how the wheels work. Okay, fair enough. Right, so we kind of mentioned it earlier. Yep. These are all old men. They're right. Like, well, whilst wisdom uh, experience... Older, thank you very much. Old men. <laughs> uh, whilst I'm sure they have lots of wisdom experience, surely he must have, like, mates his own age. Oh, there are. Okay, cool. Who are they? There is, of course, Hephaestion. Ah, uh, Hephaestion. You, you say that like I should have an <laughs> oh, air of recognition about you will, them. You yeah. will do. So, <laughs> okay. Hephaestion is roughly the same age as Alexander. Who? 18 at this About point? 18, yeah. Okay. Um, although we're not exactly sure. We don't know a huge amount about his early years. Um, but it's likely they both met as students of Aristotle. Oh, right, so others were allowed to be taught by him. It wasn't just he went like, you come here, teach my son and no yeah, one else. Yeah, I mean, but again, Hephaestion's from these kind of, yeah. these aristocratic class, so it's not just some, oh, you get off the street. No, but I, didn't, I, didn't, I would have thought Philip, or I, in my head I imagined Philip just like, no, you teach my son, my brain box son, and no one else, but he let others, he let be, others be in the class. Yeah. Okay, so they've known each other a long time, childhood Yeah, friends. like childhood friends. Something... Is Along those lines, has he done anything say. to warrant, other than just being his mate, to warrant being in the inner circle, or is he just had known <coughs> for a while? Are you chortling, Helen? <laughs> oh, is he that kind of companion? <laughs> well, <laughs> so to answer that question about yeah. his position um, in battle, to be fair, there is little mention of Hephaestion directly. Okay, um, but we're told that he's a cavalry officer and commander of the royal bodyguard. Okay. And so that, 
So if he's so if he's so he's high up if he's got a horse, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it means that he would have fought right beside Alexander, which is pretty much where he was most of the time. What do you mean by that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't well, know what you mean. The funny thing is, without a doubt, Alexander's closest companion and his absolute favourite. Um and they do share a very intense and very close bond. Mm -hmm. So throughout the campaign, Alexander continually looks to Hephaestion for support and promotes him to kind of key positions. Okay. And again, what's clear from the source is that there is this really, really deep connection between the two, um, not just because they've been friends for a long years. And you see that especially in Alexander's reaction to Hephaestion's death. No, I've no spoilers, spoilers just yet. <laughs> he's not still alive, James. I know, but all right, he dies early. But he yeah. dies, and there's this whole big to do. Um, and yeah, they even do things like Alexander marries him and Hephaestion into two Persian sisters so they can be family and right, really okay, close. Okay. And, and it was often said, I mean, this speaks for itself. It was often said by ancient writers that the one thing that Alexander could not conquer was Hephaestion's thighs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, well, it's never explicit in the sources. Well, I was going to say, because the Greeks were fairly open about their sexuality, weren't yeah. they? So, is this all just kind of kind of innuendo? Or are, is there, are there any sources that say, yes, they were lovers? Um, it's whether the sources that say, yes, they were lovers can be relied, relied upon. So that comment right, okay. about Hephaestion's thighs comes from kind of cynic philosophers a few a bit after Alexander. Right, okay. In Plutarch particularly, there's, it's not explicit. Mm -hmm. It's not like, and then Alexander and Hephaestion kissed and held hands <laughs> and laughed at Darius's bird. That'd be nice. But yeah, given the kind of the nature of the relationships you'd see in the Macedonian army at the time, it's, unless we're going down for the kind of the 19th century historian of saying they were roommates and that is all. Yeah. Yeah, they were. Okay. I mean, Alexander always wanted to be kind of the living Achilles and Hephaestion would obviously be the Patroclus to his Achilles. Mm. And, you know, those two were very close friends. And he died early as well. And he died early as well. So, yeah, it, it's it's pretty, I'd like to say, we, you'll, we'll probably get someone typing a comment on now saying you can't prove this blah 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 it, it's a pretty safe assumption yeah that alexander and hephaestion were in at least in some part or at some point lovers okay. which is only kind of strengthened without giving too much away by <clears throat> alexander's response to his after death. hephaestion dies yeah yeah okay. it, it's not a normal response no. okay it's <laughs> quite extreme yeah i i wasn't look forward to hearing about it but I'll, I'll, I'll wait for it. Yeah. So when we look at the companions, obviously there's kind of a couple of th key things that emerge. Obviously we've picked out the obvious that they're all Philip's mates, yeah. mostly, mm. and that fits, like you said, nicely with that transition into... From one king to the next. From one king yeah. to the next, especially having <clears throat> such a young, arguably inexperienced king. It just um, makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. wise advisors. We've also looked at, like, they're not just courtiers hanging around on fancy cushions. They've got a military role. They've all got their particular skills and their key parts to play um, in the army. And that's really the big thing with the companions. You always get this idea that, yes, Alexander is this great general and does great things. But when you look at the things he does, one of the arguments is, well, could he have done it without these companions yeah you know doing what they did or you could even flip it if you want to go really down the line and say well to be fair you could have put a chicken in charge of the macedonian oh, army succeeded. and <laughs> these guys would have successfully well, led the couldn't the counter argument be <clears throat> that they would have to have some level of respect for him to continue fighting the way that they didn't be so oh, successful yeah. because if they didn't think that he was a good enough ruler if they're so good Let's yeah. face it, his dad's dead. They could have just binned him off and got rid of him quite easily. Oh, absolutely. Or just not fought for him and said, well, we don't think you're good enough, so yeah. we're not going to But he, he does all, let's not forget, he does also have these mad lad ideas yeah. that show kind of real strategic brilliance at some point. Mm. But again, <coughs> one man cannot defeat no, an no. entire nation on its own. So they are absolutely essential but it to is, this campaign. 
it, how unique are the Macedonians in that, that there's like this council where they listen to him? Because quite often, a lot of people make mistakes because they just do what they want and don't listen to him. Yeah, else. It, it's not unique in Greece. Okay. Um, we know, like, certainly the Athenians before the Battle of Marathon had the problem where there were 10 generals of the 10 tribes and they all had different ideas and because it was 10, no one could decide. Yeah. So this idea of open discussion is not uncommon in Greece. Um, but again, Macedonia is sort of Greece, but not Greece. Yeah. But they make more of a deal out of it, certainly when Alexander, shall we say, changes mm -hmm. later on, this kind of idea disappears. Right, okay. So it's very much kind of the early stages of the campaign, these experienced generals, he listens to them, to some extent does what he's told, um, and that leads him great success. How, how big is, because you mentioned four there, how big is his council, or is it just these, are these the four key people? Or, or? We're never really told how many it is. It probably changes hmm. in size, um, but yeah, these at this point, at the start of the campaign, these are your main guys, the ones who get written about, the ones who get mentioned. There's probably other people there, but you know, they're yeah. just like meat they... in the room. Okay. Just stood there going, oh, I agree with him. I agree with <laughs> what he says. Clytus, please don't hit me. <laughs> and look at his thighs. Yeah, there's a lot of thigh admirers, clearly. There's there's not a statue somewhere where it's got tremendous <laughs> thighs in it, is there? It's like know. a really small body and a small head, but like yeah. massive thighs. I'll have to look that one. Maybe it was like the Kim Kardashian of the ancient world. She had a massive backside, he had massive thighs. <laughs> I don't think she's invaded Persia yet, no. has she? Not no. yet. No. <laughs> this time. So there you have it, our quick look at the Alexander's Companions, round one. Yeah. Um, we hope this has been useful. Thank you for listening. Leave us a comment below. And until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.